Welcome to Earrings Off. I'm Lou. And I'm Teresa. Let's get started. March is Kidney Disease Month. So we're going to talk a little bit about that during today's broadcast with Taniqua Shepherdson, who is currently on dialysis. In people aged 65 through 74 worldwide, CKD, chronic kidney disease, is estimated to, to exist in about one in five men and one in four women. 10% of the population worldwide are affected by chronic kidney disease, and millions die each year because they do not have access to affordable treatment. Over 2 million people worldwide currently receive treatment with dialysis or a kidney transplant to stay alive. Yet this number only represents 10% of people who actually need treatment to live. Chronic kidney disease can be treated. With early diagnosis and treatments, it's possible to slow or stop the progression of kidney disease. On to our interview with Taniqua. My name is Taniqua Shepherson. I'm 34 years old and I am currently a dialysis patient at DeVita 3 Chop. Um, I am a wife to a wonderful husband named Kurt and I currently work full time for the Department of Juvenile Justice as the PREA Alternative Placement Manager. I also am a youth counselor at Chesterfield Juvenile Detention. I am also a PhD student studying for my PhD in criminology with a concentration in juvenile justice. And I am also the owner of Elevated Events Planning and Coordination by Taniqua. Mm, nice. Well, it sounds like you're very, very busy, of course. <laughs> okay, so um, Taniqua, can you talk about about when did you first learn there was a problem with your kidneys? Um, well, I first learned in eighth grade, so I was about 13, maybe 14, um, that my blood pressure was actually trending upwards. So that's what actually caused the doctors to do further testing and resulted in me having to have a biopsy, a kidney biopsy. And from that um, kidney biopsy, it was discovered that I was losing function in my kidneys. So um, I had about, at that time, about 55 to maybe 60% kidney function, which would have put me in stage two, going into stage three of, of renal failure. Mm -hmm. um, I had heightened levels of creatinine, which is protein in the urine. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what started everything as far as monitoring for blood pressure and residual kidney function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I know I've shared with you that I'm particularly interested in this subject because renal failure is runs rampant throughout my family. I have siblings that have been on dialysis and had transplants and so many um, first cousins and aunts and it has just, and even my father, that um, so this has always been something that I'm particularly interested in. So again, thank you for, for joining us today. Did you know anything, anything about kidney disease before your actual diagnosis? Well, I had very limited education. My grandmother actually was on dialysis. She did um, perinatal mm -hmm, dialysis. Mm -hmm. So my earliest memory of education of kidney dialysis was staying with my grandmother over the summer and having to help her change out her bags yeah. um, of the, the fluid. I really didn't understand what was really going on during those times. I just knew that my grandmother had kidney issues. She had the tube in her stomach and that she ran her treatment at night. Mm -hmm. Um, right. and, and of course, that peritoneal, that's the dialysis that's performed at home. So right. it's supposed to be more convenient, but of course, without the medical personnel there, there are a lot of precautions and that you have to take to, to do that safely at home. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that was actually something that was offered to me to do, but um, I opted for in-center treatment just because at the time my husband was working overnight, so mm -hmm. it would be hard for me to sanitize, right. get the material, and put myself on the machine. Right, mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, so with my family, outside of my grandmother, um, my grandmother's brother, my uncle Sonny, um, he actually was on dialysis as well in his later life. Um, my grandmother passed away in August of 2002, and my uncle Sonny started dialysis uh, maybe in 2000, in the later 2000s. Um, so outside of my uncle Sonny and my grandmother and myself, we are the only ones in my family that I know really? of that battled kidney disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we take a step back? I'd like to go back to those, your middle school days when you first mm -hmm. had to go to the doctor and they, they let you know that you were experiencing some loss in function there. At that time, did they share with you what the cause was? Did they know? Um, well, at that time, it was kind of a bunch of things they were looking at. Um, they initially thought it might have been lupus, um, I have a dormant trait of lupus. Okay. And um, then looking at my high blood pressure, that actually runs in my family. Mm -hmm. So that became the primary um, reason for, for the kidney failure. And um, I think that's also important to note that high blood pressure and diabetes are the leading cause of kidney failure. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So that would, that's what they're accounting it to because still – even while on dialysis today, I still battle with um, blood pressure. It's under control through medication, mm -hmm. but that is something that has been a constant throughout my whole journey. At what age were you when you were first diagnosed with high blood pressure? Um, we found out about that that same time okay. when they started noticing that I was having an increase of creatinine in my okay. urine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, do you have yeah. siblings? Yes, I have a brother and a sister, and I have two older half brothers. Okay, so and none of, none of those, none of your siblings are dealing with high blood pressure because I know you've said you're the only one with um with the um, kidney issues, but right. none of them are also neither of them are dealing with the high blood pressure either. Correct. Nobody okay. in my immediate family okay. is dealing with any health issues really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Taniqua, talk to us about the actual dialysis treatment. Can you help listeners understand what does that look like and the impact on your day-to-day -day activities? Okay. Um, well, I go to dialysis every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'm there from, it's, it's my treatment is three and a half hours, but I'm really almost there for maybe four hours once you add in the time for getting on the machine and getting off the machine. Um, I started dialysis at MCV. And um, when I first started dialysis, I had a stent placed in my chest. And they would um, do my dialysis through my stent. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, you're not able to get that stent wet. So, you know, no showering. And you have to be very cautious with it to snag on stuff. And um, it's a stent that goes directly through your heart. So um, maybe about six months in, I got a fistula mm -hmm. in my left arm. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much they joined and made me a super vein mm -hmm. in my, um, my arm, which is where I get dialysis at now. So um, every treatment, two 14-gauge needles, I get stuck um, in the upper and lower part of my upper arm. And that's what filters the blood out to clean it and sends it back in. Um, it's it's hard being confined to the chair for that time. Yeah. But um, sometimes your pressure drops and, you know, they have to give you more fluid to keep you from passing out. Sometimes you cramp when they pull too much fluid off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, they're like, oh, well, it's a cramp. Well, dialysis cramps are different. It's yeah. not like a trolley horse you get yeah. <laughs> when you're in bed. Talk to me about those. She shared with me about those. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Like I've had cramps that make me want to cry. I remember I tell people all the time, I will never forget the first time I cramped at um, MCB. Um, 
it, my toes were balled up, my legs were stiff. Um, you know, I was hooked up so I couldn't get out the bed. Um, my husband was frantic because I was frantic. I was crying. Um, the nurse was running to get saline to try to give me more fluids back. And at that time, it was really just because trying to find my dry weight. Right. Um, right. It was kind of trial and error at that time. Right. So, um, yeah, those cramps are are something else. You, it leaves you sore for maybe two or three days afterwards. So, yeah. um, but yeah. dialysis for me, it's, you know, it's been a journey. Um my texts, my dialysis texts are just excellent. They keep me laughing. You know, they are the unsung heroes of this journey because, you know, they don't get the accolades that they deserve, but, you know, they take great care of me. And it's definitely made a difference in my dialysis experience. When I first started dialysis, you know, I was scared. I, you know, had only known what my, I seen my grandmother right. go through, right. but to have it personally, you know, it took a, a, t- a toll on my spirit. And of course, starting out in dialysis, I actually went through a bad bout of depression. Mm-hmm. I lost over a hundred pounds, not eating, mm-hmm. and um, I became malnourished. Mm-hmm. Um, it got to the point that I couldn't care for myself. My mom had to bathe me mm. and um, I was just real fragile. And, you know, that's part of the story that a lot of people don't hear. You know, they see me now right. and wouldn't imagine that that's how my journey started. Right. You know? right. So, so what got you through that, Taniqua? My mom and my husband, you know, it was many nights where my mom cried over me, prayed over me, my husband prayed over me, prayed for me. You know, I had to go in the hospital and you know, no matter where I was, my husband, he spent so many nights in the hospital mm-hmm. with me, not complaining, learning along with me so that, you know, in instances where I wasn't able to speak for myself, he was able to advocate for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, just my support system you know, I was at a really low point and I did, I felt like giving up, you know, I went through the why me, you know, I'm so tired of always being sick, you know, something's always happening to me, that self-pity. Yeah. And, you know, one day I woke up and I said, you know what, I'm here, you know, God gave me this battle for a reason. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. at that point I decided to live and, you know, from there, I started, you know, taking care of myself again, started working out, gaining some weight, traveling, doing things that I love. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just made a promise to myself that I'm not going to feel sorry for myself anymore. I'm going to live. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to let the disease control my life because dialysis is just a portion of my life. Right. It's not, you know, it doesn't consume me. Mm-hmm. And I just started looking at that time at dialysis as my me time. Mm-hmm. You know, I do reading. Sometimes I'll do homework. Sometimes I'll Wait, just rest. Hold up. You, mm-hmm. you say your dialysis time is your me time. That mm-hmm. is amazing to me. You know, I used to be a, a renal social worker at MCV. Now, these mm-hmm. years ago, that was my job on the kidney, um, the dialysis and transplant unit. And that is amazing. That attitude. That's your me time. Yes, that is my me time. Mm-hmm. Yep, that is the time that I, you know, just sit and it's three and a half hours. You know, I can spend that three and a half hours doing really whatever I want. You know, I see people at my clinic <clears throat> sometimes and they do kind of seem down, they seem sluggish. And I use that time, I laugh a lot at dialysis like I said you know me and my techs we have a really good relationship so I've had friends who don't know anything about dialysis or kidney that just want to support me come and sit with me through treatments my my sister comes sometimes and sits with me my husband comes they know him (laughs) and you know I've just learned to make the best of it it's something I have to do to stay you know living so, you know, when I go and I try to laugh with the other people getting treatment, you know, just stay positive because it's easy to slip into that why me, you know, 
that why me stage. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you share some ways or that maybe you, the community or your family, what has gotten you to the point where your mindset is like it is? What has helped you move that has kept you from seeing yourself as a victim and the why me mentality to knowing, okay, kidney disease does not define who I am. So how did you get to that point? I would say my family and my faith. I have a really good support system in my friends and my family. I think what's made it easy is that my family has went through this journey with me. There's not a time that I can remember since I got my, we first started talking about my first transplant that my family has not been beside me, supporting me. My husband, like I said, is, he is my rock. I mean, he's seen me at my lowest. Mm. He's, you know, seen my growth through this. He's supported me. He's never once made me feel bad. Mm. You know, I think something that a lot of people don't understand is that with kidney disease comes a lot of other issues. Like me and my husband, we've been married going on nine years and having a child is something that we both have really wanted. But unfortunately, due to my kidney disease, that's something that has not been able to happen yet for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in addition to me having this diagnosis and going through my why me phase, I also went through the phase of, you know, my husband gives me everything and the one thing that he wants, I can't give to him. That in, in conjunction with the kidney is kind of coupled into what went into my depression. Just having his support and reassurance okay. has been really important. My friends, they are excellent. They call me all the time. They check on me. Like I said, they come and sit with me through treatments. When I've been in the hospital, they've been there. They've met me at the hospital. They've sat through testings and diagnoses with me. And my church family, you know, through this process, mm -hmm. I've... Yeah just met so many different people who are going through this journey. I've had so many people reach out to me to talk about my journey. I've had coworkers who have family members going right. through this who really don't know what else to do. And I've written letters to family members. I've, you know, like I said, had people reach out to me through Facebook and Instagram, just asking me how I stay so positive, right. you know, and that to me, I feel like it's validation of why God gave this battle to me. Mm -hmm. you know, I mm -hmm. love talking about my journey to people um, because I feel like if somebody can just take one thing from my journey and apply it to theirs, then, you know, my servitude is, is, is being carried out. Yeah. Um, a lot of people ask me about traveling, how I travel. Yeah. Well, I've traveled and to you do travel to it at my hand. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I've traveled to Cancun and I've had dialysis there and they're like, you went out the country. They don't speak English well. And I tell them, you know, that comes with education. Um, being on dialysis, you need to know what your machine is set to. You need to know your dry weight. You need to know what gauge needles you use. You need to know what type of filter you use because that's something I found out. The first filter. So you take first, control of that. that as yes. a patient. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. The first filter I was on, I actually was having an allergic reaction to it. So they end up having to um, do a, a different filter. So I have to make sure when I dialyze at other clinics that they know that so they use the right filter so I don't have those reactions. It's mm -hmm. all about educating yourself mm -hmm. and right. so you can you know, be able to travel and do those things that you like. Taniqua, tell us a little bit about where you are now in the process. Well, now um, I'm currently on dialysis, and my journey was a little different to dialysis. Like I mentioned earlier, when, once I got to maybe stage three, going into four of 
renal failure, my nephrologist, Dr. Pepiot, he started discussing with me my options mm -hmm. and transplant was one of the options. And so we decided to do transplant, my initial transplant as a preventative measure. Excuse me. So um, my mom got tested and she was a 100% match. And so she was my first donor and we transplanted in November of 2014. Mm -hmm. And in September of 2016, I lost my first transplant. My disease um, came back. And the disease that I have is, it's called focal segmental glomerulochlorosis. And it's short for FSGS, which is scarring of the kidney. Uh -huh. And um, so that returned in 2016, causing me to lose my, my kidney. And that's when I started dialysis. Okay. So currently, um, I spent 2017 through 2018 looking for a donor. And my sister actually got um, tested and it found out that she was 100% match. Mm -hmm. And so we started the workup to transplant mm -hmm. from there. And my current transplant team advised that we do what's called a donor exchange because with what they said was getting another kidney from a relative, my kidney disease may return more mm -hmm. aggressive. Mm -hmm. So they suggested that I get a kidney from someone who's not related to me. Right. And so in order to do that, my sister had to agree to donate her kidney to a stranger. Okay. And so thankfully she was like, you know, whatever it takes to, you know, make sure my sister's okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're now in the paired exchange program. And at some point this year with the coronavirus, things are kind of at a standstill right now, but we'll be doing the transplant where she will do donate her kidney to a stranger. And in return, I will get a kidney back from someone else. Mm. That's amazing. Can you tell our listeners why it's important for us to be considering being donors, not just for kidneys, but just a donor in general, because how, how, how important that is to our community? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I think first it's important to note that um, renal failure and especially the disease that I have, is very prominent in African Americans, mm -hmm. um, more so than any other race. So I think it starts with, you know, just being proactive and talking and providing that education because a lot of people don't know about donating and how easy it is. And it's, it's a process like anything else. Um, donation is, like I said, fairly easy. Um, the initial part just starts with contacting the kidney center for an initial screening. Mm -hmm. So they'll go through health questions and lifestyle questions. If you pass that phase, you'll move on to the evaluation phase. And that you have to go to the transplant center where they will do a series of tests to make sure that you're a good match. Mm -hmm. um, so that includes, you know, blood sampling, physical checkups and things of that sort. Once you're found to be a good candidate to be a donor, they want to make sure that you are um, healthy enough to donate and that you're also a compatible match for the recipient of the kidney. I think it's also important to let people know that being the donor, there's no financial responsibility. The cost for the testing, the evaluations, the surgery, hospital stays, it's all covered by the recipient's insurance. Wow. So there is, you know, no fee. That is good to know. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I think that could be a deterrent in someone's mind because mm -hmm. that's a huge ex expense being hospitalized and the surgery and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's also important to let people know that there's no harm in getting tested. Right. Um, it's, it's painless. Like I said, the initial part is just a series of questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me was kind of hard, you know, cause my mom, she was just saying, you know, reach out on Facebook. And, and I was like, no, you know, that pride, I, I, I just didn't want to do that. Right. And you know, um, 
of a lady that was at my clinic. She actually did a story with Channel 12 on her kidney journey. Uh And she was able to get a donor based off of sharing her story. Okay. So um, that's when I say, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to put some education on Facebook. So I did. I, I The same information I just shared is the kind of the same information that I shared on Facebook. Okay. So even if, you know, if you're not found to be a match for that person that you're trying to donate to, you may be a match for someone else. Right. You know, live with one kidney. So, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's important to know. Right, right. Tanika, again, thank you so much for, for speaking with us. But we want to ask um, before we end, is there anything you want to say, anything you want to share as parting words that can help educate or, you know, just something you want to share with our listeners that can be a benefit to the community? Well, I think it's, you know, important to self-advocate for yourself. Um, if you know that high blood pressure, diabetes runs in your family, you know, be proactive and, you know, just ask to be tested, ask for them to, you know, get those cultures and things on your kidney function. With kidney disease, there really is not a lot of symptoms. So a lot of times people don't really catch it until you're further, you know, down in the stages of renal failure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to stay active and you know, just watch your diets and stay healthy. And, you know, like I said earlier, don't let the disease control you. You know, I understand that people are going to, you know, feel certain types of ways, but allow yourself to go through those emotions. But if you feel yourself slipping into depression, which is something that I didn't do, seek help and just remember to live. I think that's the most important. I think that people get so caught up in the disease itself that they lose themselves to the disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's important to live, laugh, and celebrate that you're here. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that since I've been doing, I've been a lot happier. And dialysis is just a portion of my life. It's not my whole life. You know, I still like to go out and do things that I would do before. I just think you have to you, you adapt your lifestyle, especially when it comes to fluid intake. You know, most people don't know that dialysis patients are restricted to 32 fluid ounces a day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, going over that fluid ounce can, you know, harm your heart. Eating certain foods that are like high in phosphorus or potassium can cause um, calcium buildups inside and that can possibly prevent you from getting your transplant. If they go in and it's too much, you know, buildup, they can't transplant. Education is really important. I think that's something in the very, from the very beginning, when I found out what was happening was the first thing I started to do was educate myself on what was happening. What will life be like? What adjustments will I have to make to stay healthy? Even after transplant, what will my life will be like? You know, because after transplant, you pretty much are on a series of pills for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. The dosages may taper off, but you have to take these pills the rest of your life to avoid rejection and, you know, stay healthy. Mm -hmm. So I would say just, you know, maintain a close relationship with your care providers. Um, If you have questions, ask. If you don't, you, you notice something changing, ask. I remember when, I stopped making urine. I got really scared. It was like, I'm not using the bathroom. Is something wrong? Mm -hmm. And my nephrologist had to explain to me that this is what happens, you know, with dialysis patients as you totally lose function of your kidneys. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to make sure you attend all your, your treatments because missing treatments can put your life at risk. Yeah. Okay. Well, Taniqua, again, thank you so much for meeting with us. You've certainly provided a lot of excellent information. Hopefully, Taniqua's journey and the knowledge she shared about kidney disease will be of some value to you or someone you know. For our regular listeners, you know exactly what's about to follow. When we know better, we do better. Thank you for listening and take good care.